professional athletes live a life most of us only dream of. There are some drawbacks to this career, however. Besides action on the court and training on and off season to keep in top form with the constant risk of injury ready to ruin your whole career, there's the business angle to consider. Let's go over the worst contracts in the NBA right now and you'll see a bigger picture if you watch till the end. Before we begin, let's talk about how this is a two-way street. There are players who get cheated of their value and players who make off like bandits while providing nowhere near the value of their price tag upon the hardwood. Will the NBA's most in-need teams be able to keep control of their stable of players at a reasonable rate or will they have them bawling hard to an early wounded retirement with little left to show for it? We could name all sorts of names and today we will. Just keep in mind that this knife cuts both ways as some entries on this list may surprise you. Curious? Well, watch on. You'll need to see the whole thing to understand just what I mean. First off, Markel Fultz. As we look at the absolute worst cases of contracts in the NBA for 2023, we have to consider a man who was once an absolutely elite prospect. That would be Markel Fultz. His story is truly one for the NBA history books. Due to a tragedy related to a nervous system condition, this man functionally forgot how to shoot. This led to a complete and utter dashing of all hopes and expectations for this once prodigious rising star. Fultz has shown a few glimpses here or there of his former grandeur, but the reality is you cannot get his gene back in the bottle. Nerve damage and nervous system conditions are still very difficult to figure out for even the most advanced medical science specialists, so sadly, they are just not able to get him back to where he was. Yet despite all that, he's making $17 million next season from a team that is not doing great in the backcourt. He's getting a wild amount of cash due to signing that contract before the incident, as Jalen Suggs and Cole Anthony now must pick up his slack on the Orlando Magic roster. Next up, Evan Fournier. We have ourselves a man, a b-baller, a basketball tier if you will, who's looking to draw down a fat $18 million dues for the singular season of basketball next season. He's making more than $1 million per point per game he was averaging last season at 14 points. The New York Knicks were running negative 4 points in the game when he was on the floor. Not exactly an asset they're paying for so much as a lack they're playing around. Fournier is a solid player in his role, but $18 million is a lot of money that could be used to shore up the Knicks roster in other departments. He should not really be a starter at this juncture in his career, and offloading him would free up so much room for alternates, it's not even funny. Everyone can use a good shooting guard or small forward, and why not both? But at his price tag, it's just not worth it. Now we get to Eric Gordon. While the Lakers want to ensnare him, Eric Gordon is actually in one of the worst NBA contracts out there. His price tag is just south of $20 million. He's a shooter, but very injury prone, and a veteran who has perhaps passed his career best setting years by this point. Gordon played 36 games three seasons ago, 27 games two seasons ago, and 57 games last season. He's no starter, he's not up there on defense like he used to be, and he is fundamentally just there to shoot. He'd be a godsend to teams like the Lakers who need a three-pointer like a frog needs water, but he just isn't providing good synergy where he is right now for his costs. He is a great pickup if you are a championship contender with cash to burn, but his price tag is just way too high right now to burn it all on him. After that, Spencer Dinwiddle. Spencer win what? He didn't get to turn his contract into a cryptocurrency token in his abortive attempts before the association banned it outright. Spencer Dinwiddie, despite having a few embarrassing escapades, has managed to hoard over a veritable treasure trove of cash through his $18 million a year contract. While not backed up by a global ledger of graphic cards farms to ruin Kazaki fuel prices, it is still gold for anyone who likes real, oh sorry, a fiat money. He's a solid point guard, we'll give him that, but he's injury prone and not terribly good at defense. The Dallas Mavericks really just need to free up that $18 million more than they need him. Maybe he'll defend people's wallets by warning them off of NFTs as community service after all the exchanges are done imploding. So we've got Jalen Brunson. Now the New York Knicks have a bit of a knack for signing contracts that are not really being paid off by their players receiving them. When the buzzer ticks and your tens of millions of dollars worth of players have not won you the game, you could call it the nick of time you feel nipping you on the bud. One more proof of this tendency to add to the list is Jalen Brunson, who has strong ties to the front office. Nobody else in the league was about to offer him nearly the cash that they were, so he gladly signed a board to make over $27 million a season. He has a four-year contract for over $100 million, while averaging 11.3 points per game. He's not a bad player, to be sure we can't outshoot him, but keep in mind that he is not exactly winning them any championship rings for that money. Sadly, we think this has more to do with close relations with the front office than anything that makes sense for the game or business of being an NBA team. Nobody would want to pick up this player for this price, but also, the Knicks can't really afford to keep him. What a conundrum. A very bad contract. Running up the score here, Gordon Hayward. Gordon is a real powerhouse while healthy. Sadly, he's not often healthy, and that makes his price tag hard to justify. He has two years on this deal and could be traded for many players of interest to the Charlotte Hornets. He is versatile as a scorer and defender, which makes him a good all-rounder to acquire. He scores from all three levels and engages in short creation for teammates frequently. That being said, 
he's no longer who he was in his All-Star days. He hasn't played more than 52 games in any of the past three seasons. For infrequent adequacy, the Hornets sing him a song to the tune of over $30 million. That is not a cost that can be afforded by anyone involved in the art and craft of building a solid team for championship contention. It's an overcommitment of cash for a player of his caliber, and a crying shame for anyone hoping to acquire his skills. Now we get to D'Angelo Russell. There was once a bargain to be had with acquiring D'Angelo Russell for his standing contract. Now, that looks like raw onions as we go through the 2022 through 2023 season. He was perceived as an incredibly powerful scorer on his way out of college. He looked like a superstar after his opening season with the Brooklyn Nets. He couldn't keep that up in the Golden State Warriors, however. They flipped him and Andrew Wiggins. He's not really in an athletic mode at the moment. He's struggling to get shots off during playoff games, but gets a clean $31 million plus. His contract runs out the season after next, and we do not expect him to be made a similar offer. Hopefully, he'll have a bang-up season starter on the next go-round and be able to retrain a significant portion of that retainer he's raking in right now. Otherwise, a huge drop in salary could tempt him to retire. So here we are, Tobias Harris, a good player fitted with an utterly outsized contract. We've got Tobias Harris. He'll never live up to the tall standards that this price tag of his implies, sadly. He is a good shooter, makes the rebounds, and overall keeps to and plays his role well. We had huge success in the playoffs last season, which is a key factor to success. He averages 17.2 points and has 6.8 rebounds average. That gets him how much money, you ask? Well over $37 million this year and $39 million the next. He's one of the top paid NBA players and top worst NBA contracts. This contract simply will not make sense for any sort of renewal unless a lot of calculus changes around this scenario. Black and he's uh, enjoying shooting. Now here is Westbrook! Throws it in! Didn't quite have the force that he wanted to, but he still threw it. Here we are at last, Russell Westbrook. Perhaps the worst of the contracts for the team holding him is Russell Westbrook. His deal is so bad, other teams are asking for two first-round picks to take him. He makes $47 million next season and is coming off perhaps the worst of his performances in his career. He refuses to change at all, and he just continues to make mistakes while making money hand over fist. Westbrook is a first ballot Hall of Famer, will obtain MVP, and was once the best player of his generation. However, his big contract is too much for a problem player. If traded, it's most likely he'll be bought out. All that considered, what is to be said of these contracts? Overall, these contracts existing might not be a great thing, but the fact that they can is good. Let me explain. The NBA actually has an incredibly high degree of player agency in their contracts. NBA players have lobbied more regularly and harder than most professional athletes to secure a high amount of contract solidity. They can negotiate at a high point and hold on to the benefits they negotiated at an ideal point. This helps level the play field between players and the front office. Thanks for watching B-Ball Basket Cases. Like to sign for 20 million and subscribe to shoot a sub 10 point average for four years while you rake in the dough.